good answer. Oh, you are. Okay. Um, I'm going to get us back on track time-wise a little bit because um, Greg and um, Phil both kind of, you know, we're covering the same topics a lot. So obviously we're going to have some overlap, so I'll be able to kind of, you know, pick up the pace a little bit here. But uh, still, I believe we're going to add some, some different perspective because I'm looking at not only cleaning under uh, bottom terminated components, but also, you know, case studies, things that we've seen from our customers looking uh, at companies who are and who are not cleaning. Uh, QFNs are what we focus on most time. That's, you know, predominantly the, the big uh, bottom terminated component package that we're seeing out there. So, you know, I'm going to look at a couple different case studies and how we're able to help the customers and, you know, ways to optimize each process. So, you know, we do a lot of these conferences. We speak a lot. And, you know, generally it comes down, you know, you go through 50 slides and at the end, you know, clean is good and dirty is bad. You know, I mean, that, that you don't need to be, you know, a rocket scientist to figure that one out. You, you've had enough field failures to, to know that. So, you know, having said that, like everybody else has already spoke on a lot of these reasons. So I'll, I'll touch some of those as we go along. And uh, some ways that we found to really not just make it easier to clean, but just be more effective. So some little free things to do, you know, optimizing wash equipment, things like that. There are very, you know, th there are a few things that um, that you can do for nothing, you know, and, and increase your uh, optimization or excuse me, the effectiveness of the cleaning. So we're going to look at a couple different ways to do that. So, you know, this is what, you know, you're going to see, you know, this is what you don't want to happen. This is why, you know, we're not, uh, you know, this is why we have to clean and because Eventually, if you don't and you still have active residues on the board, somewhere on that you're going to get that. So that's what you don't want. So why clean? You know, no reason. You know, like, like I said, you know, I've got two kids that's in the college. Please do not be concerned with cleaning. You know, this is what I do for a living. So feel free to ignore these issues. I'm okay with that. But as you can see, I mean, it leads to this type of flame out. Uh, here's a quote. Uh, you know, I was doing some, some plugging around and I went to one of the uh, component manufacturers and almost the very first thing it says, you know, on, on their tech data sheet for one of the components was no clean flux should be used because the small standoff of QFNs does not leave much room for cleaning. I mean, I, I know you guys can read, I just like to drive it home. You know, the component manufacturers are telling you use no clean flux. And then your customers are telling you, you have to clean these fluxes. You know, so you're getting kind of conflicting information coming from component manufacturer versus your customer sometimes. So you insist on cleaning for a lot of the reasons that I mentioned before. So, you know, it's, can, it can be very difficult. Visual inspections, um, you know, it looks good to me because you're doing a lot of, it's very hard to visually inspect these. You know, you look at the edge, you, you look at, you know, some of the terminations on the edge of a QFN and everything can look, you know, pretty good and, and you don't think there's an issue. But, you know, as, um, you know, I believe Greg had this picture, could have swore this was from us. <laughs> but, uh, you know, these pictures get around. So, I mean, you can see flux residue there. There's a little there, some there, a little bit there, a little bit there. You know, you kind of get the picture here. It's, it's everywhere. You know, you're not going to key in on one point every time. It's going to be in random positions. So, you know, why clean? Because you don't want to flame out. So, you know, looking back a little bit, and, you know, kind of hitting on some of what the previous speakers were saying, you know, you've got a large thermal plane. And, you know, you've got that solid termination. Uh, but, you know, we're seeing a lot of companies moving away from this, both uh, device manufacturers and then, you know, companies owning their own process are going to a window pane. They're doing some things to increase the standoff for volatilizing these flux, um, the flux residues for, um, you know, being able to clean underneath them. So, you know, when you're looking at a, a, a solid plane like that, you know, this, this is one of the most difficult pieces of, of, or one of the most difficult components there are to fully complex and properly assemble. And, you know, this used to be tied to, you know, the problem with QFNs, but it, it's one of the main problems with QFNs, you know, is that large heat sink, you know, if it covers more than three quarters of the component surface, you're going to have a lot of the drawdown. You're going to have floating. You're going to have, you know, it doesn't necessarily, you know, leave you a nice solid surface. Um, so, or an, excuse me, a nice level surface. So you get this, uh, when it, as it cools, the QFNs will shrink based on, um, you know, stencil thickness, things like that. So, you know, it's being able to access the flux residues to clean them out or them having a place to go as they volatilize off. You know, you can see the, the shift um, as well, you know, between the ground and the perimeter. So, you know, it's, it's not just necessarily one thing that, that's causing 
Um, the issue, it's a little bit of the, you know, the standoff height, the way it positions itself, you know, as, as it cools. So you're looking at a, a couple different things you have to battle against. So it, it's a fact, you know, QFNs, they, they, they save money. They're, they're taking the, the place of other components, but they increase headaches, you know, and how do we know? Well, because I happen to have a headache per dollar saved-ometer. You know, and we, we put this on a couple guys at the quality level, you know, and that's pretty pegged. You know, and, and that's just good science right there. I mean, there's no two ways about it. Why you aren't good. Um, we're going to look at a customer case study that we did. And this customer was having leakage. Obviously, you know, they're having some sort of a failure. That's why they come to us. So they were having an electrical leakage issue related to the QFN. We'll look at the initial findings, recommendations, and conclusions. It was a satellite uplink, so this is something that this company had been building, you know, for you know 10, 10 years or so, and then they went away from a uh, from a dip to the QFN, and that's when they started having problems. Uh, the QFNs had heat sinks and the thermal vents that have been discussed, you know, a couple times already this morning, and this is the case study we're going to look at where the customer was not washing the uh, not washing the assemblies. So, you know, this was the, the, the board itself. You know, you're looking, um, this is, you know, as received, everything looks fine, much like that first picture earlier when we said visual, you know, observations don't necessarily tell you anything. So there's that same, this is the, the board this part came from, you know, showing all the gooey flux underneath there. So, I mean, the flux residues that you see on the right-hand side there, you know, they're very hydroscopic. They're going to continue to draw in ambient moisture as it's available. You know, anything from, you know, not changing from night to day temperature, depending on your end-use environment, you know, this could be, you know, a long-term problem or you could get, you know, infantile, you know, type failures, depending on the amount of available moisture and, and voltage. And, you know, this is the close-up of that component where it's still showing, you know, flux everywhere. So we did some ion chromatography. And, you know, this was a no-clean flux, so there was a weak organic acid uh, was used as the activator for this flux type. So it was, you know, succinic, malic, malic, something in that family. But, you know, we all have our same limits, or we all have our recommended limits. You know, uh, DFR has theirs, Trace has some. I know, you know, um, Rockwell, that they have their own internal, a lot of people, but, you know, give or take a few percentages, you know, they're, they're, they're in the same ballpark. So with, with these, um, with this board, looking at the, the part and the board surface um, together, you know, you're looking, you know, they had an average of 266.91 micrograms per square inch of weak organic acid. So this is after processing, you know, it's still a very active residue. It's still very hydroscopic, as I mentioned before, that was causing the leakage issue. So what we told them to do was something that, you know, again, has been mentioned a couple different times. Change how your pads are, are printed. So we gave them a, a design recommendation. They took it back to their layout guys, and they came up with this idea. And, uh, you know, and what we're trying to do is give all of these, um, or excuse me, give the flux all of these different avenues to exhaust out. Because if, if you don't have that, obviously, you're getting a lot more voiding. Uh, you're trapping a lot of the contaminants inside um, of, uh, and across the bottom part, uh, bottom side of the component. So now you've got active residues, again, drawing in moisture, looking for voltage differential, and setting up electrical leakage and, you know, ultimately uh, electrochemical migration uh, dendrites. And this is after that they implemented the, the different pad design. I mean, you can see on the left-hand side there, you know, the difference in the standoff. You know, with the solder mass change, you know, you can see how it's sitting above the, the surface of the board, you know, three to four mils, where it's under a mil, you know, beforehand. So you can see a dramatic change in the, the, the standoff, which will allow these flux residues to, you know, get out of there. So, you know, after the process change, and, you know, we did another round of uh, test and we, you know, removed the QFNs and did some ion chromatography. You know, we went from 266 to 13.81. So it really showed that, you know, A, you're putting down, you know, less paste in general. So you have less flux to volatilize. They were still getting good connection. So, you know, the standoff was better. The exhaust avenues were there. So um, this company was able to, you know, dramatically reduce, you know, the, the amount of electrical leakage, you know, to zero, you know, for the same, uh, for the same component on the same board. So when they're processed, you got to give them the room to, to uh, get that flux residue out of there and increasing the avenues, obviously, you know, did a, did a really good job of not only, you know, increasing the standoff height, but giving those volatiles uh, from the flux someplace to go, not just staying entrapped. 
And as I said, this company, no, no further contamination related field failures. So now we're going to wash them. So now we're going to look at cleaning of, of QFNs, which is a, is a real problem, especially if, if you're going to you know, process with no clean flux as, as you're recommended to do. In general, it's tougher to remove by design. So we're going to look at you know, basic issues for you know, cleaning in general, uh, different equipment parameters, and water quality. You know, and these are all some of the things that, uh, you know, that go into any wash process that you can use you know, a lot of these same ideas to, to, to increase effectiveness no matter what you're washing. And uh, the improvements made. So you know, you've got the QFN removed here and you can see the voiding and then you know, close up of what they were leaving behind with the no clean flux uh, with, their, with their wash parameters as they were uh, when they came to us. So you can see you know, plenty of flux residue in between the, the, the outside uh, edge of the component. And again, you know, we're looking at weak organic acids, you know, about around 218 per, mi uh, per uh, micrograms per square inch, that's it. So CMs and equipment manufacturers recommend high spray pressures, you know, including up to 100 PSI. You know, obviously, this is not a blanket statement. Some, you know, there's a number of different cleaners out there, and depending on if you're using a batch cleaner, if you're using an inline washer, um, you know, a big portion of what we do is recovery cleaning. And what we have found to be more effective than high pressure you know, is really low pressure, high volume. You know, we allow a saponified wash to do its job. Uh, we would slow the belt speed down a little bit. We're not a, a contract manufacturer, though. We have more time to clean, so it, it doesn't always transfer to a, a big production facility. So you know, we like to bring our spray pressures down to a, you know, no more than 60 PSI. And like I say, we, we slow the belt speed down a lot to help the saponifier actually do its job as far as chemistry goes of softening the flux residues and then being able to flood the area. Um, when you have you know, 90 to 100 PSI, you're getting a lot of bounce back with the chemistry. So you're, you're coming straight down from, uh, from the nozzle and the, you know, the idea you want to clean on a horizontal plane, but a lot of times what you get is atomization and bounce back. You've got your exhaust running through your inline. So now you've got these particles, these atomized particles of saponified wash that are going up your exhaust. So, you know, that, that's money, you know, going up the chemistry, or excuse me, going up the exhaust. Um, and it does not increase the fluid dynamic on the horizontal plane, especially with, you know, BTCs. You can't clean straight down and expect to get underneath, you know, a, 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 a component of this style. You just have to get more contact time. Um, so with this customer, you know, we found out city water was being used. You know, that's the first thing, like I say, no, no, who thought that was a good idea, but it was probably the boss's son. So, <laughs> not, so that was the first thing that, you know, made the alarms go off. Uh, they were running at 100 and F. Um, it was mentioned before, you know, as you increase your temperature, you lower surface tension. It's, it's a pretty good ratio. Uh, again, pressures were too high. Uh, impingement angles all at 90. And you know, again, this goes back to the, the bounce back effect and, and lessening the effectiveness at the horizontal plane. So here is the, um, you know, here's our guide basically that shows surface tension over temperature. And you know, once you get to about 150, you're starting to look at diminishing returns. So once you get around 150, um, your dynes go down. Uh, you, you can get to the 25 to 30 dynes you know, when you're looking at about 150. Um, the city tap water also, you know, obviously it's going to include the impurities. Anything that's in the, the, lo you know, the local water supply, you know, it's okay to drink, but it's not okay to clean boards with, if that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm not a doctor, I'm a board guy, so I don't know. It may not be okay to drink either, hell, I don't know. So, you know, we're leaving, you know, behind what we find most of the time with city tap water, you know, calcium and magnesium, and really you're going to you know, also see a lot of sodium. Uh, these are things that we've found historically, and, and, you know, it does differ from, you know, town to town. So it, unless you're going to test it, you know, do some thorough testing up front, really, I mean, just don't use it. You know, you want to use a, a good quality DI water when you, when you are cleaning electronics. So. We looked at the impingement angle. Again, they were you know, 90 degrees straight down. And what we found that a slight cant, I got a couple photos here, you know, about 20 degrees on our incoming and our exit spray bars, we were able to increase efficiency or effectiveness of the cleaning itself. So you've still got you know, your two middle bars, um, like for the um, AquaStorm 200 that we have 
two machines, one of the Aquastorm 200. We have found that if you just can't the entrance and the exit sprays on the wash and the rinse, 20 degrees inward, we're able to really, um, really look at a much more effective wash process on that horizontal plane. And it decreased the bounce back because you're not coming straight down. The, the energy is being dispersed at this level instead of you know coming right back straight up. So they're saving money. So you know this is um, you know when you've got straight down, you're getting all this bouncing straight back up. You know that's just physics. Now if you cant it just a little bit, you know the idea here is to have that flow you know going horizontally. And you know here is. You know, an action shot. You know, this is what it looks like. You know, in, in our cleaner, where we've got you know a little bit of that cant. You can see uh, even without the board in there. You know, you can see that that is really you know it wants to run on a horizontal plane. So, I think Zabruder took that film for me. So, with this customer, after these parameter changes, you know, we were able to bring that weak organic down. You know, to about 11.9. There's that, virtually nothing there as far as flux residues go. So, I mean, as you can see, you know, look at your perimeter pads, everything's looking a lot better, getting up close. You know, you're still going to have, you know, flex here and there. It's very difficult to remove 100% of no clean flux under a low standoff component like that, no matter uh, your cleaning operation. The key is to know that what if, there, if anything's being left behind, that it's a benign residue, that it's been fully complex. I mean, that's the whole idea behind you know, no clean, being able to thermally activate everything and, and any residues left behind should be benign. So let's look at how to test. You know, you've got a couple different options. You know, historically, you've got the rose tester, uh, iron chromatography, and that's pretty much it when it comes to testing for cleanliness on, on components like this. So, you know, looking at rose testing, it's historically accepted. You know, it's been around, you know, probably longer than electronics somehow. I mean, I, I think it's what that, uh, I think the test method was developed, you know, late 70s, early 80s by the military. You know, it was an old mill standard taken over by the IPC. Um, it's very common. It's, you know, fairly inexpensive comparatively. And obviously, you know, we get asked a lot of times is that, you know, what's the IP, what's the industry test method? You know, what's the standard that you have to test to? So, I mean, it's a standard that's been around forever. But the limitations. Um, and uh, I'll cover limitations here in just a second because, you know, it shares some with ion chromatography. Um, ion chromatography in, in, in our, um, you know, in, in, from our point of view, you know, ion chromatography is really the best tool that can be used for determining, you know, if the residues are active and, you know, really increase your risk of electrochemical migration or, or electrical leakage failures. So, I mean, we're big on ion chromatography. It's what we've done for over 20 years. It's very expensive. Both, I mean, if you're going to do it in-house or farm it out, it, it's not a cheap process. Um, you know, it has a IPC recognized method for what that's worth. Um, but the, the limitation I want to go back to for ion chromatography and rows that they share this limitation where if you have a board that's processed, you know, very well, I mean, you, you've got good, clean wave solder, you, you know, you can, the, the problem with both of these test methods is the ability for it to determine, you know, small areas, you know, pockets of contamination. Because rarely does the whole board fail. You know, it's going to be one circuit, one component, and you really can't tell, you know, what that is with, you know, with either of the IPC test method because they will normalize out pockets of contamination over the entire surface front and back plus 10% for the population factor. You know, so if you've got 20 micrograms per square inch of chloride on one component, by the time you normalize that out over front and back, you'll never be able to determine, you'll never pick that up. You know, it's going to normalize out over the surface of the board. So, um, you know, localized extraction is the key. And you have to do, with the QFNs especially, you know, mechanical removal. Um, it, it's destructive. There's not a real good option for that other than, you know, we take a flat blade and a, and a hammer, you know, and you have to knock it off to do your visuals. You're looking for, you know, f visible flux residues, things you can't pick up with, with x-ray. Um, and, you know, this allows you to focus on just the QFNs or any bottom terminated component, anything that's going to be harder to test ionically. Um, and use ion chromatography. Like I said, it's not cheap, but it is definitely worth it as far as getting the real answers. So you've got some options. You know, you can do a corner or edge extraction, um, which is it, it's better than a full bag extraction if your component is uh, situated as such where you can get you know to get that semi um, you know 
uh, ex excluded from the rest of the board. You know, that's, that's the idea is to measure just that. Uh, flowing river method. Um, if, if you are not using the solid um, thermal pad on the bottom, you can do a flowing river method if your solution is able to penetrate underneath the component. So you basically do, you, know, you have a heated um, tub with, with your 7525 or whatever your extraction um, fluid is going to be, you use a pipette. Um, a lot of limit, a lot of um, drawback for this test method is, you know, controlling surface area, being able to do ion chromatography with a good dilution factor because you have to know the exact surface area. So that has a limitation. Wipe extractions. Um, a lot of companies, uh, I've, I've seen wipe extractions that they don't really, uh, they really tell you more of what's there, not how much of it's there. You can't guarantee that a wipe extraction is going to remove all of the residues prior to the, the ion chromatography testing. And obviously, I mean, you would have to remove the part to do this. If you're going to wipe, you know, where the QFN was and, you know, in the second picture there, the, the Q-tip, I mean, that, that's basically worthless when it comes to testing a, a bottom terminated component because you just can't penetrate that gap. Dam and fill. Pop the part, put some RTV around it, you allow it to cure, and then you know you, you put your heated uh, extraction solution inside the the, um, the little square that you just made, little area that you made. That allows you to uh, better calculate surface area, which is good. Um, but one of the drawbacks is obviously whatever material you're using to create that dam, you have to be sure that it's ionically you know, clean and you're not adding anything to the, um, to the end values from what you're using to do the extraction. Static tube method, uh, similar. This is one they actually use uh, up in Rockwell. A lot of these photos came from a paper Doug Pauls and I did uh, earlier this year, doesn't really matter, um, on different ways to do localized extractions. So you know, their method was a little bit cleaner. Um, they had, you know, the area is known every time because it's a preform basically. And, um, and this is one of the methods that they use uh, pretty commonly. And then there's a, a localized uh, automatic method. So it doesn't really matter. I mean, it does matter how you get to the, your end data point, but you just have to remember localized is the key. You don't want to include everything on the board to determine how clean your bottom terminated component is. So, you know, and in the end, you know, there's a stress gauge for all this. You know, feeling good about your process, that's a good place to be in the green. You know, panicked a little bit, that's when you have to do a little more uh, reading, a little more worrying about that. And then. Obviously, if it's in the red, there's no reason to worry about that. Everything's already on fire, so every man for himself at that point. <laughs> so, I mean, you want to stay in that green, and this is more good science right here with these gauges. Uh, they're, they're hard to find, but they're out there. So, if, if you're aware of how you're processing, if you're aware of the residues, where they're coming from, and how to best um, eliminate them, you, you, instead of recovery, you know, look at a way to fully thermally process your QFNs. Make sure that when you're doing your, um, doing your thermal profile for reflow, you want to make sure that you're taking a lot of measurements around your QFNs. If these are tied to thermal vents, thermal vias, that may also be tied, you know, to, you may have vias that are tied to, you know, a, a heavy ground. You know, if you're looking at two, three ounce copper, you know, it's just a matter of a couple degrees difference between a fully complex flux and an active residue. So knowing how how to properly thermal, um, to thermally profile these components is as important as anything else, especially if you're not going to clean. You know, you want to make sure that what's there is benign. You know, do some repeatability studies, um, knock the parts off, make sure they're clean, and then follow that, you know, follow that method on as far as your thermal profile on a regular basis. So, you know, knowing where they come from, how to, how to avoid them becoming an issue in the first place really is, is the best way to, to process a, a bottom terminated component. So, I said it at the first, I'll say it again. Clean is good and dirty is bad. So thank you. Are there any questions? Hallelujah. Not a thing? Really? Oh, there's some. Go ahead. The standard is 75% IPA, 25% deionized water. That's for ion chromatography, and that's it's actually up for debate right now. Uh, 7525 versus 1090. There are a couple different schools of thought that 7525 is a little too aggressive 
and you're actually going to start leaching out things that would not come into uh, come into play in our normal field service environment. There's a couple schools of thought, but it's, it's up for debate right now in, uh, in in the task groups. So you know we're doing the fall meetings uh, co-located with SMTAI this year. So anybody interested in this, please, for God's sake, come down and have your voice heard because you know we do listen. <laughs> FTIR, I mean, we have that capability, but FTIR really, you know, tells you what it is, not how much of it's there, and you know, it, it, it's hard to assess risk with FTIR. It, it's really a, a, a chemical signature, not a you know type and amount kind of testing. Right. You know, really the answer is both. I mean, it, the, the channels are there for a couple different reasons. You know, with, with you know, one of our case studies we looked at, you know, this company was not cleaning. So they had to make sure that, you know, all of their, um, all, as the flux volatilized, you know, all of those gases had some place to go. You know, they weren't getting trapped. You know, we're getting much low, a lower amount of voiding now. You know, uh, I believe um, Sandy's paper showed that. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at, you know, for that for that purpose, if you're not cleaning, but if you are clean, these channels actually do open up and then allow for more effective cleaning, not only in between you know the outer contact points, but it, you know if you can flush through that point, and you know I'll say you know you pretty much 100% you're going to have to use a saponifier of some sort. You know you have to use a, a soap to break that down to soften and then push it through. Uh, but if you have those channels there, you know it gives you really more opportunity to flush underneath that component and, and fully remove all the flux residues. So I mean the, the really the reasons are you know the benefits are twofold. Whether you're going going to clean or not, you know, there's a benefit to changing your, your, your pad design. For an OEM, or, well, any manufacturer really, let's say 90% uh, of your product does not have VGCs on it, and you've got a long history of successfully using no clean fluxes, have you seen where uh, you can remove no clean residues using a saponifier with Good results or oh sure, yeah. But but you know, as I mentioned, it you can't use water soluble parameters. You know, really, that, that's really what it comes down to. You know, you have to you you have to pump temperature. You have to you know give if you're using saponifier, you have to give it you know more time to do its job, more contact time. Really, you know, we've found to be you know fairly key. You know, and and putting more solution on the board by lowering or lowering the pre the spray pressures. You know, but at the same time, I mean, historically, I mean, we get, we hear that all the time. Well, we've been doing it this way successfully for 25 years. You know, all of a sudden now we're having failures, but they're they're still using the same you know mindset of parameters for the equipment setup versus you know now you have to tailor everything around one part. I mean, but. In the end, you're going to get cleaner board. You're, the rest of your board will be even cleaner because you're doing. If, if you can effectively clean a QFN, you know all your resistors, all your through hole stuff. You know it's going to be incredible. You're going to get that shiny joint everybody wants because, as everybody knows, shiny equals good, right? So, so, so you know, you're going to increase. You know your cleanliness on the rest of the board. You know as long if, if you're tailoring the cleaning process to a very hard to clean component. Well, we, we've not done a, a large study on this, but we have done some trials where nitrogen actually is a little easier to clean because you keep out a lot of the impurities, you know, in the solder, and therefore you transfer less impurities to the uh, to, to flux residues. So you know you're, you're breaking down, you know, less garbage, so to speak. You know, it's, so it's a little easier to clean. But at this point, I can't say you know definitively nitrogen versus non-nitrogen blanket. You know, really makes a huge difference. I mean, it's something that's very interesting because there's a you know fairly small population really you know that we've seen using nitrogen versus non um, so I, I've not really had a chance to get my hands on a lot of nitrogen versus non-nitrogen you know exactly the same kind of process to do a one-to-one -one comparison but I mean in, the, in my very small sample size it seems like you know SMT under nitrogen is actually a little bit better a little bit easier to clean 
So if you're set up with a no clean process, mm -hmm. and you, uh, you've got just one or two of these on there, I mean, but is there a way to local kind of spot clean? No, because you, you need so much energy from temperature, saponifier, you know, spray pressures, things like that. I mean, it, yeah, it, it, because you don't have any extra temperature with that, the contact time is very minimal. You know, when you're really trying to penetrate something that's, you know, anywhere from half a mil to, you know, four or five mil standoff, I mean, you need all these different, this combination of different energies to really fully, you know, get underneath there. Um, we do a lot of steam cleaning for uh, when we do recovery. But it, it, it's very effective. I mean, I, I can highly recommend steam cleaning, but boy, will it drop your production. <laughs> I mean, if, if, you're, if you're building, you know, 30 boards a week, it's a great option, you know, for removing no, flux res no clean flux residues under any kind of component. But if you're trying to do any kind of volume, steam cleaning is just not a real option. So uh, spot cleaning, no clean under VTC is, is a very tricky, a very, very tricky thing to do because, you know, we found, you know, our experience is, you know, you really need that combination of thermal, flow dynamic, things like that. You know, it takes all of those things together to really clean underneath something like that. And drying, drying everything afterward and getting things back to all that moisture, right. Still got to that out too. right. Yeah, and you know. That's more time in the process. Well, and it, it is a little more time, but it's worth it. We have a lot of customers that will use a second reflow oven or a, or a conformal coat cure oven or something like that. So they'll take the boards out of wash and just go straight to one of these, you know, drying racks or you know, cross flow oven, something like that. But they'll do a, you know, an in drying process after the wash just to make sure because you're right I mean that's why it's really key to same reason it's really key to use good quality DI water because now you've used that DI water with saponifier which lowers the surface tension even more well now you got to chase that out of there you can't just trade no flux residues no clean flux residues for you know cleaning solution so now you got to make sure that you're be doing a very effective job at rinsing and because it's very hard to not leave some residues behind you know, we rarely see, you know, zero on anything, if ever. So being able to fully rinse is just as important as being able to wash. So you've got to use high quality water, you know, all the time. And then, you know, obviously the upfront validation testing, you know, is just of the greatest importance to show how, our, how well does our equipment with these parameters clean this type of component. Because I mean, you can't just test it. You can't just throw the whole thing, you know, in ion chromatography or a rose test or something like that and expect to see any, you know, meaningful numbers at the end that, you know, are just for that QFN. I, you know what? I, I, we have so few customers that are doing vapor fa phase reflow. I would, I would love to do that test in conjunction with a nitrogen blanket. So I, I really, I do not know. And you know, I don't think, I don't know of anybody doing vapor phase reflow that is cleaning. Because it's you know the perfect process, you know you have much less variability of you know uh, being able to thermally exercise those no clean fluxes across the entire surface of the board. You know the way everything comes to the same temperature, you know 100% of the time. You know you're not seeing these variations of cleanliness levels from one zone to another, if you were. So I, I cannot answer that question. I, I have not done any that I know of for sure. Edwin. Yeah, I realize this thought process is not the target, but I was just curious if you've had any experience of uh, active solder flux under components um, that was aided by conformal coating because it could have been entrapped and then not allowed growth to occur underneath the component, anything like that? So basically, what is your question? Does conformal coat stop yes. electrical leakage? No. Paralene is as close as you're going to get, and you're not going to paralene over no clean flux residues. So uh, anytime you have an acrylic or a silicone type, um, it, it will retard the situation for sure. I've got, I've got scads of pictures that show uh, dendrites growing under and through conformal coat. So what, what it really does is it'll retard the situation. It will not eliminate the situation, you know, it, at all normally. I mean, it depends on what your product life is. And remember, cleanliness, guys, I mean, it, it's such a variable. Because if, if you're running 577 volts and you've got 10 mil spacing, your boards better be clean. You know, but if you've got you know, 50 mil spacing, you're running you know, three volts, and it's only on when you hit this button, you know, if you've got the pulsing current or whatever, you, know, you could have the dirtiest board in the world and you'll never know it. 
You know, it, so it really comes down to knowing what your product is, what the end environment is, and how clean your product needs to be. There's not one set of numbers that anybody has that's going to apply to every process out there. Because high voltage versus, you know, class, you know, regular class two, you know, class three has to be cleaner, but it still comes down to voltage differential, available moisture, you know, and spacing, you know, and even surface finish. And solder mask, if you're doing matte versus glossy, things like that. All of these things come into play when you're trying to, you know, gauge whether or not you're going to have electrochemical migration, you know, related failures. So, I mean, you just have to take all of these things into consideration, you know, and conformal coat, it'll slow it down. But if, if you're in Florida, you know, it, you can conformal coat all you want. If you're in Arizona, I don't care if you ever wash your boards. You know, you're just never going to have that condensation. So, you know, knowing your board, what the end use environment is, and the uh, the amount of available moisture, where it can get into your uh, into the circuit, you know, versus voltage differential, there are a lot of variables that come into. So that's why I always say, you know, we like to say, you know, clean for that hardest to clean part, and then everything else will be even cleaner than that. You know, in theory. So that, that's really the idea. Thank you. Nope. Oh. We got a we got a, we got a bonus question. Bonus question. <laughs> uh, in your presentation, you mentioned that 100 degrees uh, was not adequate. I, I don't, don't remember if it was Fahrenheit or something. That was Fahrenheit. Yeah. Uh, what what for an open residue would you recommend? For uh, 150 is what we like to see. I mean, you can get it fairly effective anywhere, really 130 to 150, okay. somewhere in that neighborhood, but you don't want to be below 130. I mean, you, you really, the, like I said, 150 is where you get your point of diminishing returns. It's right around there that, I mean, and a lot of equipment won't handle much more than 150 anyway. A lot of cleaning, I mean, even some of the best I've seen only go up to 160 if you're running standard inline. So, you know, 150 is, is maintained. You can maintain it throughout most systems, and you know, we found it to be very effective. So, but w once you get below 130, it can actually, you know, get kind of spotty. So, okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Eric.